You wanna finish what you started? You came to the right place. Them girls that you came with, you might have to part with. Depending on how this thing shakes. Wabatosa, Kenosha, Economy Walk is in the house. Okay, welcome to another episode of The New Look with uh, a very special guest who I've known for a long time, Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster. General McMaster, how are you, sir? Hey, great, Congressman Gallagher. Great to be with a good friend and a great servant of the nation. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, you know, I know you've been doing a media blitz and you've been on TV and all that, but really, once you get on the, the New Look podcast, that's when the the sales of the book will spike, and there are tens of people in Wisconsin who listen to this on a regular basis. Well, well, Congressman, you know, my, I set my sights, I, I'm sorry to say, a little bit higher, but I couldn't get on Dancing with the Stars, uh, but, but I'm happy for this opportunity. Thank you. Well, this is a perfect segue into my first and most important point I want to make, and I want to preface this by saying I intend this as the highest compliment, but you are the rare, if, if, if only general officer I know who has managed to retain their sense of humor throughout a long and distinguished career up the army ranks. How, how is that possible? It's a critical survival tool, Mike, as, as you know. And, uh, you know, I do think though, I mean, not that, not that I have this quality, but I, I think that, I think that empathy and a sense of humor are correlated. I think psychologists have figured this out, you know, and there's an important skill I think for any leader to be able to be empathetic and, and you know, and you got to be able to laugh, right? I mean, I, I think as a leader, you just have to be lighthearted and find the humor in, in sometimes even the most difficult circumstances. Well, and I, I have having worked for you, I've I've seen the humorous side. I've also seen the times when uh, serious HR, mission oriented HR takes over. Uh, scary HR, dare I say, takes over. So it's good to be able to have those different modes. But let's back up a little bit and. So where, where does the story begin? Does it begin in Philadelphia or where, where are you from? Where'd you grow up and all that? I am from the, the center of the universe, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And, uh, and I grew up in the Roxborough neighborhood. Great, a great, it's a great city, a lot of characters, as you know. And, uh, and I, I grew up in a, in a family where my mom was an educator who instilled in me a, re a real curiosity about history in particular. And my father, who had served as, as a, a BAR gunner uh, in the Korean War, as an enlisted soldier who volunteered at age 17, remained in the reserves and was a first sergeant and later a company commander for a reserve infantry company. Uh, so I was exposed to military service. And like my youngest memory, I think, you know, maybe I was three or something. I, I just always wanted to serve in, in our army. And, uh, and so I, in, in, a, in, a, in the opposite of what sometimes is the case, I begged my parents to go to military school. I went, I went to uh, I went to Valley Forge Military Academy. Had a great experience there, academically, athletically, and so forth. And and then applied uh, for an appointment to West Point. Went to West Point in 1980. What uh? So in terms of athletics in high school, what uh? What did you play, and and how did that kind of shape your high school experience? Well, I was on the synchronized swimming team, Mike. Yes. And uh, I knew that. <laughs> And speed, people don't know, but back then speedos were even tighter than they are today. So, no, I, I, played, I played what you would expect. I I, uh, I played football and uh, and and played baseball. I wrestled really badly, and then mercifully, uh, after a knee injury, <laughs> football my junior year, didn't have to do that again. Uh, and I dabbled in basketball, was pretty poor there, but I but I you know I was okay in in, in football. I played quarterback and. Safety and, and middle linebacker, uh, and then uh, and then in baseball I played third base, and uh, I came from a big baseball family uh, too, so I I hope to play these sports at West Point, and, and then, you know, West Point recruited me as a quarterback, and then realized that I it, in what was a straight drop back offense, a pro set offense at the time at West Point, now it's you know, a wishbone offense, but uh, discovered that I you know they discovered I could not even see over the offensive line, so that wasn't a good match. <laughs> and I, and I played, I, I went to, to the rugby pitch uh, and then played rugby for four years, you know, and, and really enjoyed it. I mean, I, it's a great, it's a wonderful sport. Uh, so I, at West Point, I, I mainly focused on on uh, rugby and uh, and boxing in the winter. Um, it just to go back to high school or growing up. So, so then if you're from a big baseball family, what were what were just the sports allegiances growing up and what was the intensity Phillies versus Eagles versus different sports. What did that look like? And honestly, yeah. I, let me confess my bias. Even though you guys are technically at the top of the NFC East right now, which is a terrible division, you shouldn't even have a, a playoff berth. Uh, <laughs> I I think Eagle I think 
Eagles fans are mean, and uh, I would be scared to go to a game at. Uh, well, I mean, you should never really, I think, it's unwise typically to wear the jersey of, of a team other than the Eagles at a game because, you know, the fans are, I would say, passionate is what I would say <laughs> and uh, about about sports in, in Philadelphia. And, you know, I, you know there, there have been season tickets, Eagles season tickets in my family since the 1930s when they, when they, when they used to play it. Now what is the, the Franklin Field, you know, at the uh, at University of Pennsylvania. My my um, you know my my 80 81 year old aunt you know goes to every game every every you know every season, um, and my cousin uh, has has a has a uh, RV that is only for the tailgates, and every tailgate is at least two meals right. So if it's, if it's an afternoon game, you go for breakfast and lunch. If it's an evening game, it's it's lunch and dinner. And he does a fabulous job. His friends are awesome. I mean, I, I went a couple times with his national security advisor. Uh, and, and it was just a blast to introduce like the Secret Service guys, to these guys, you know, and, and uh, I'll tell you, Philadelphia is passionate about their sports. I mean, it, sometimes they get a bad rap. I think it goes back to the time when they threw ice balls at Santa Claus and, right. and, and, and bloodied his nose and, and ran him off the field. That was an unfortunate incident. But 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 I think I think, you know, I, I think that that uh, they're passionate across all the sports. Now, of course, you know, if you're a hockey fan. You know, I love the Flyers. I can't understand why everybody doesn't love the Flyers. But then I realized as I talked to other hockey fans, they really they really don't like the Flyers outside of Philadelphia. And it goes back to the to the Broad Street Bullies days, right? And but I would just say, you know, be proud of that team because they knocked the hell out of out of the uh, of the Soviet Red Army team, if you remember that game. It was the last game on the tour. I think they had played three games previously. And they, they, they played like the, the, the Broad Street Bullies that they were. They just knocked the hell out of them, legally, legally. And then in, in the, in, in the, in the, uh, in the, I think it was the second period, first or second period, I, the, the Soviet Army team, they left the ice and quit. <laughs> and had to be told, hey, listen, you're not going to get paid unless you come back out. And I think that they thought, okay, well, now that we pretended like we we're going to quit, maybe they'll take it easy on us. Well, they didn't. I mean, they still... They still checked the hell out of them, hit them really hard. I mean, it was a great team back then, and and so but but Philadelphia's very you know they're very they're very passionate about their sports. Uh, I think the Eagles uh, figured out last last week that it is not the preseason anymore. So I'm hoping that that they after beating the 49ers, you know, will have a better season uh, for the rest of the year. Um, okay, so the 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 Flyers thing is a perfect segue into deterrence by denial against the communist adversary, but we have to come back to that. We're still in the origin. Origin story. Uh, okay, so you come from a military family, or your, your father was in the military, but you, I mean, at a very young age, decided you wanted to pursue a military career. Was that, I imagine that was very unusual. Did you, why do you think that was? What what sort of led you down that path? You know, I read a lot of these youth biographies about about military leaders and about uh, about service in in, in, our, in our army, and I was really drawn to the to the you know, to the to the less tangible rewards of service in which you're part of an organization that's committed to a mission bigger than, than, than themselves. And, and then part of an organization where, you know, where the, you know, the service man or woman next to you is willing to give everything, including their own lives for you and, and how those, the, those organizations grow together like a family, you know, and, and I just thought this would be tremendous rewarding to be part of a team that, you know, and, and this was the height of the cold war that was fighting, you know, for freedom and, uh, deterring then what was the, the, our, 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 our rival, the, the Soviet Union. Um, and, and then my every experience I had kind of heightened my desire to serve. And in high school, Mike, I got to go to Romania, uh, which in the, in the 1980s, as you know, under Ceausescu was, was uh, late, late 70s, uh, uh, was, uh, was, was a brutal place, brutal dictatorship. And I was just struck by the lack of freedom. And I thought, man, we, we are so lucky in our country. And and this is worth defending, you know. So, I, so I, I really, you know, every, every experience heightened my desire to serve. I always wanted to go to, to West Point in particular, and uh, and serve in, you know, serving in our in our army. So at West Point, well, first of all, there's a, an obvious connection between Wisconsin and and West Point uh, football, uh, and that is Douglas MacArthur, who got his appointment to West Point from Wisconsin, uh, whose father famously won the Medal of Honor. Fighting with the I forget the name of the unit in the Civil War, uh, uh, although he got it later on in his career. And then in this book, uh, the best book of all time about Vince Lombardi, he taught. I mean, Lombardi learned at the feet of, of Red Blake, and MacArthur was obviously obsessed with 
uh, the West Point football team to the point where he'd be asking for updates when he was in the Pacific. And so there's a proud tradition that links West Point football to Wisconsin to the Green Bay Packers. I hope people appreciate that. And yeah, I mean, Labar was a, was a coach at West Point. A lot, a lot of really successful coaches started started at, at, at West Point. Uh, you know, Bobby Knight, you know, started started his his coaching career. Uh, Mike Shashevsky started his coaching career. You know, at at, uh, at West Point as well. Uh, but but it's it, you know it's a it's a unique environment at West Point. It's challenging, but you know what I loved about it too is you make some great friends. You know, those those, those rugby teammates. Uh, you know, my classmates at West Point. They're just really great friends. You don't have a lot of diversions, you know, in terms of entertainment uh, at West Point. You know, it's it's really about uh, about you know academic study, military training, physical training, sports. You know, but you develop a very strong you know f- fellowship uh, you know ac- across uh, you know across your class and on sports teams and 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 you know I, I think also when you face a challenge, those challenges br- bring out the best in people. You you, you rely on one another. Uh, you see people who are very generous and, and helpful and, and helping you get over your obstacles and you help them back. So I, it was a good experience overall. I didn't maybe appreciate it as much when I was there. I was I was sometimes misunderstood and a victim of circumstance as a cadet. But uh, <laughs> but I, I, but I made it through. I made it through nonetheless. So you were not you were not number one in your class like uh, the good old Douglas MacArthur was. <laughs> no, 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 not a pretty a far cry from that, especially with the commandant's office. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let me ask you about that. Your, your career is too storied uh, to dissect every aspect of it, but I would be interested when you, so you, when you graduate West Point, you do your specialty training and then you go to what we would call in the Marine Corps, the fleet, their operating forces. At that point in your mind, were you thinking, okay, this is a career or is this just, I'll see where this goes for five years and then figure it out after that? Right. It was just to see where it goes for five years. I know I want to serve for five years. And Mike, you know, what I just say for any young people there who are listening, you know, don't, don't feel any pressure to map out your whole career. Right. I mean, it, you know, just do what's fun, do what's challenging, and it will open doors later. I would encourage service in, in our military. I, I think, as you know, I mean, Mike, as, as a young person, a graduate from from university or as a young enlisted soldier who gains the rank of uh, of corporal or sergeant in our armed forces, you're given more responsibility at a younger age than anywhere else in life. And the, the private sector values that too. You know, you're, you're developing as a leader at a very early age. But I, I, I really uh, had in mind to be an aviator. I was commissioned in aviation. And then I went to the armor uh, basic course, armor and cavalry basic course at Fort Knox, Kentucky. And they found astigmatism in my eye that they hadn't found before. And, uh, and so they said, okay, well, you're now an armor officer. And I said, well, I'd rather be infantry that was my second choice. Can I go to Fort Benning, Georgia and start infantry training? They said, oh, you can't do that. It's like cost effective. So that's how I became an, an armor officer and, and a cavalry officer. And so I, I then thought, OK, they're going to have sympathy, right? I mean, I, I didn't get to go to flight school. And so I said, hey, I'd really love to go to Germany. That's where the Cold War is happening. That's right on the front, freedom's frontier. That's where I'd like to go. They said, hey, great. Thanks for your preference. Fort Hood, Texas, it is. So I went to, go to, I go to Fort Hood, you know, and. And then the first job is a different job than I thought. It was, it, tanks grew on me, especially when I was in ranger school, th- saying, thank God, you know, I, I can be on my tank and not, you know, be walking through swamps uh, for days at a time. So, I, so I, I, uh, I, I went to Fort Hood and they gave me a support platoon, not a tank platoon. Didn't know what that was. It was a tremendously rewarding experience. I could go on, Mike, but really not, not, my career never worked out the way I had hoped, anticipated. But in retrospect, I wouldn't change a thing about it. Well, and I think you never, you know, it's, I think, and maybe I was part of this too when I first went in the Marine Corps. You kind of go in and you're all fired up, and it's particularly if the country's at war. You know, you wanna, you wanna go out there and win glory and get a bunch of shiny medals on your chest. And a lot of people that go down that road never have that chance. And a lot of people that don't intend to do that end up, you know, one of my best friends in the Marine Corps wanted to be an air intelligence officer because he thought he could just work out all day and do nothing. And then he got deployed on a military transition team to Afghanistan and was getting firefights every single day while the rest of us were like looking for fights in Iraq. <laughs> uh, so you just never know when, if and when your moment's going to come. But you definitely early on in your career had a unique experience uh, in Desert Storm and, um, you know, when you were uh, with the 2nd Cavalry Regiment and taking part of the Battle of 73 Easting. Uh, at the time, was it, I mean, what, I guess, what lessons did you did you learn from that, and what was that experience like? 
Well, I, I really internalized from the very beginning the importance of training and preparing units for combat. And because I was drawn to, to, to history from my mom, from my father's experience, you know, I had read a lot about, about the, you know, the psychological, emotional, moral dimension of, of battle. And, and I, you know, I was determined to build confidence in any team that I led or, or, or commanded and to do so through tough, realistic training, to recognize that in good units, you, you, you fail in training because you push the limits of your capabilities. And, and, and when I had the privilege of commanding Eagle Troop of the 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment, we trained really hard and we built a very capable, cohesive team. And we had confidence in our weapon systems that we could operate them under all conditions of battle. But really, we had confidence in each other. Our soldiers were confident in their squad leaders, their platoon sergeants, platoon leaders. And there's a there's a power to that. And and we were cognizant of it. We would we would actually talk to each other in the days before the attack in Iraq, thinking, you know, we, we are really going to, uh, you know, to, to have a devastating effect on the enemy uh, based on how well prepared we, we, we felt. And it's important to have that confidence because the worst thing that can happen in combat, I think, is, is the debilitating effects of fear, right? You, fear can paralyze a unit, can lead to hesitation, which leads to opportunities for, for, your, you know, for your enemy. Um, and our unit, I think, had that confidence uh, in battle, demonstrated it uh, in battle, and, and it resulted in a lopsided victory. Did you ever think at the time after you had deployed and then redeployed back home that wow, I may be back in this country under dramatically different circumstances a little over a decade later. Yeah, you know, I, I thought about it because, you know, we wound up after, you know, after our, our battle against the, the, the Republican Guard, the Taliban Division of the Republican Guard, we then were part of the occupation of Iraq. And our troop was the, the, the unit furthest into Iraq. And it's what we could call now Route Tampa, but it's the main highway that goes to Baghdad. And so we were just just to the west of the city of Nazaria and and and, and Talil Air Base, one of the biggest air bases for for the Iraqi Air Force. And by the way, we were we were in the biblical city of Ur of the Chaldees, Abraham's birthplace. It was fascinating. And there, there's a there's a ziggurat there. There are catacombs. You know, there, there are excavated streets. That are that are very narrow because the wheel had not been invented yet. So so I mean it, it, it was an amazing place to be. Um, you get a real sense of the the weight uh, of history and and a connection, you know, to to the Old Testament there. So so we were we were we had that six lane highway. We had the, the road to Nazaria, and and I was thinking about initially. Why don't we just go to Baghdad? There's a road sign right there. Baghdad's right there, you know. And President Bush said, "Hey, we're gonna, you know, Saddam Hussein's a bad guy. Why don't we just take care of this right now?" And as I thought about it, I thought that would be a bad idea. And actually, I, I wrote, I, I wrote an op-ed when I came back from Iraq, entitled for the Philadelphia Inquirer, entitled "Why the U.S. Was Right in Not Taking Over All of Iraq." And the reasons that I came up with as I interacted with the population there is that this is a really fragmented, fractious society. It's a society that is used to a level of brutality that, that, that'll be difficult to recover from psychologically, difficult to replace with rule of law and effective governance. Uh, it would leave a vacuum that the Iranians could exploit. And so I, I wrote all this in this op-ed uh, you know, as, as a young captain because I, because I was asking this question to myself, what should we have done? Uh, and of course, uh, these were the factors that complicated our efforts in Iraq after 2003. You're pretty prescient on that one. Uh, I'm going to skip over a lot because in the intervening years, you uh, got your PhD in in history. It's important to point out, not not in political science. You are you're technically not part of the Soch Mafia at West Point. Am I correct in that? That's correct. That's correct. A, criti a critical distinction. Uh, you taught at West Point. You wrote a very famous book that I think is on my shelf somewhere here. Uh, here we go. I did not plan HR. I didn't even plan that. Look at that sitting right there. Nestled between Shaquille O'Neal's autobiography and a Raymond Chandler novel, so that's very, that's very uh, pricey a real place, estate. I'm, a place of prominence. Thank you. That's right. That's right. Uh, about failures uh, in decision making leading uh, up up to and throughout the the Vietnam War, um, and then you know you you find yourself uh, in Iraq uh, in a place called Tel Afar, and um, uh, dealing I think with the consequences of you know. Uh, debathification and not understanding the creation of vacuums in the country and Iranian influence and kind of I know it's such a complicated story but what for you what was kind of the light bulb moment in that deployment about the things 
we needed to do uh, from a counterinsurgency perspective to turn the tide uh, of the of the war? Well, well, thanks. Thanks for that question. You know, I, I tell the story in the, in the book I just finished, uh, Battlegrounds. I tell the story about our experience during the Gulf War. In the... <laughs> thanks. And I didn't mean to, to plug the book, but but I, I but I but I do tell the story as a way to illuminate the complexity of of of, of the post Saddam Iraq situation. And, and the, the need to always, unless it's a very narrowly circumscribed mission, a raid, you know, where you're planning a withdrawal from the very beginning, but the need to consolidate gains to get to a sustainable political outcome. And we didn't really anticipate how difficult that would be in a, in a post-Saddam Iraq. You know, regime change isn't something easy to do because you need something to replace that regime. And, and what had occurred, you know, is, you know in, in Iraq uh, is the Iraqi people were subjected to to just abject brutality and 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 a regime that you know that that did as much damage as it, as it could to its to its own society, and that had that had the the effect of, of fragmenting the society uh, and, and leading uh, setting conditions for a sectarian civil war, which when I arrived in Talafar was already happening. It was kind of almost all of the problems in Iraq in microcosm, and we we found these communities at war with each other, and when communities fight each other. In this case, the Sunni Turkmen community, Sunni Arab community, they viewed Al Qaeda in Iraq as a patron and protector to protect them from what they saw as a Shia Islamist government and Shia Islamist militias that threatened them with evisceration. And so it became clear to me that what we had to do is break that cycle of violence and then build mediating mechanisms between these communities, bring them back together, restore their faith in, in their own security forces such that they would believe that those security forces would protect all of them instead of prey on a portion of the population, and then restore their faith in, in their ability to advance and protect their interests through some kind of a political process rather than through violence. That entailed defeating some of the most heinous terrorists on, on earth. Uh, they had become a safe haven and support base and a, and a training base, the Quantico, Virginia, or the Fort Benning, Georgia of the insurgency. Uh, and, and it was imp important, to, important to defeat that enemy but it was also important to get to that political outcome. And fortunately, we partnered with some great Iraqi leaders, uh, uh, you know, General Najm Abed al-Jabouri, who you met, Mike. I mean, he's, you know, he's now the governor of Nineveh province. Uh, I got some help from parliamentarians. Uh, Haider al-Abadi, who later became prime minister, uh, was the parliamentarian who had the lead for efforts up there in, in Talafar and has become a, a dear friend. and. A, and I respect him tremendously. So, so I, I think we, I think we, we won. You know, we won that little part of the war. Uh, but of course, gains in war are reversible. And and in in Iraq, uh, we disengaged prematurely from that conflict in December 2011. So we made some big mistakes at the beginning of the war by undervaluing and underestimating the risks and costs of intervention. And then we made some mistakes in 2011, December 2011, by underestimating the risks and costs of disengagement. Well, I want to get in, get into your book, but just to quickly, as, as you look back on, on your career, and, and obviously it continued uh, long after uh, your Iraq deployments uh, and uh, obviously culminated in uh, serving as National Security Advisor to the President of the United States, it, as you look back on it, do you, was there a moment at which you decided, okay, I'm going to go all in on this as a career, or was it a continual process of... I'll see what the army gives me and, you know, right. I'll do it for two to three years and then I'll reassess. Yeah, it, it was a continuous process, you know, and and, and I, at first I had this idea, OK, five year commitment from West Point, then I'll transition. I'll, I'll get out at that point. Uh, our, our oldest daughter, uh, Catherine, had been born. I thought, well, maybe I'll be an attorney or maybe I'll do something in business for a while. So I, I, I signed up with kind of a, a you know, a, a, a headhunter firm, you know, recruiting firm. I bought a suit. <laughs> I had a plane ticket to go to Chicago to uh, to interview with a big company. And then I went to what's called a right arm night in our military, where you, you take your non-commissioned officers, your sergeants out for, for, for beverages of their choice uh, at the club. And uh, and then we're reminiscing, having a good time. And they said, what are you doing next? I said, well, I think I'm going to get out. And they said, what do you mean you're getting out? You need to stay in the army. And they, you know, they convinced me to stay in. So I walked home that night and, and, and talked to Katie and said, hey, how about staying in the army instead? So I, you know, I guess I wasted my money on that suit. <laughs> you know, I, I canceled my plane ticket um, and then wound up going to the second uh, armored cavalry regiment in Germany. Um, and then, and then there, there were other decision points like that in my, in my career as well. 
Uh, it's, I, you know, it's funny. I think we tend to read a, a sense of inevitability into historical events that don't feel that way at the time, which is also, I think, a, a lesson I take from your book, or at least just an appreciation of historical factors. And you cite one of my favorite historians, David Hackett Fisher, who has written the greatest book on America somewhere over there, Washington's Crossing. I just I love that. Recommend yeah, it to everybody. Yeah. Well, let's, I, you know, I don't even know where to begin, but maybe we can begin the entry point in the book, uh, in Iraq, uh, and, and I, if I sense a, a grand strategic tension or dilemma right now, it's this, how do we reposition assets and focus on the Indo-Pacific region, which I think it's fair to say we neglected in bipartisan fashion for a while, and does that require us to adopt a smaller force posture in CENTCOM, and how do we do that responsibly, if so? One, I guess, do you agree with that assessment, and, and two, um, you know, is that is that reflected in uh, the document you wrote, the National Security Strategy of the United States? Yeah, I I think it's a false dilemma, right? It, it can't be either or, and we've never been able to predict, you know, where the next conflict is going to happen, right? I mean, whoever thought that we that we'd fight, you know, an almost twenty year war in a landlocked country in, in Central and South Asia, Afghanistan, right? Nobody thought that that was going to happen. You know, when, when President Bill Clinton fired a few cruise missiles at, at, at Al-Qaeda in 1998 and called it a day, right? Uh, we didn't see you know, the mass murder attacks of 9-11 occurring. And so I think it's really important to sustain efforts to deter conflict and then also to prevent dangers, uh, dangers to our security, to our pros prosperity that are consequential, you know, from, from growing. And, and I think this is the case in the Middle East, right? I, I think a lot of Americans look at the Middle East and say, man, that's just a mess to be avoided. But what, just, when you, just when you think things couldn't get worse in the Middle East, they do. They do get worse in the Middle East. And we, we saw that you know, with the Syrian civil war uh, and, and problems that, that start in the Middle East don't adhere to Las Vegas rules, right? They, they, don't, they don't stay there, right? And, and so you had the, the refugee crisis that, that affected not only countries in the region, but affected Europe created a political crisis in Europe as well. And then of course, this the, it gave rise to, to, to ISIS, Al Qaeda 2.0, uh, a, a terrorist organization that you know, we didn't see coming. And then soon was in control of territory the size of Great Britain, was recruiting tens of thousands of people to their cause, who are now a very dangerous group of alumni, by the way. Uh, and they started immediately plotting attacks against us, right, against, uh, against aviation, uh, but also against our, our homeland uh, as well. They also engaged in a very sophisticated and slick recruiting uh, campaign, a propaganda campaign. So, so anyway, it's, the point is disengagement can set conditions for crises that then you have to cope with at a much higher cost and for a much longer duration. And so I think what we need is we need sustained and sustainable commitments and reasoned commitments abroad including in the Middle East and including in Afghanistan, which I think the approach we're taking in Afghanistan is an utter disaster now, Mike. I mean, I, I think that we, you know, we, have done, we have done what I guard against in the book, which is engage in strategic narcissism. We, we, we've defined the enemy we would like to have in Afghanistan instead of looking realistically at what the Taliban really is and how the Taliban there exists in an ecosystem of intertwined and interconnected terrorist organizations uh, that really amount to a modern day frontier between barbarism and civilization. And so I, I think understanding these challenges on their own terms and crafting sustainable long-term approaches is, uh, uh, that can be, and strategies that, that can be implemented at a cost acceptable to the American people. That's what's really important. And you know, you're one of the few people I think in, in government these days, uh, Mike, who explains to the American people what they need to know. And what they need to know is, okay, why do we care? What is at stake? And then tell me what is a strategy that gets us the security that we need uh, and protects our interests at a cost that's acceptable. I don't think enough leaders are, are talking to the American people about our foreign policy and national security in those terms. Well, let me pose that question with uh, what I think is is the, the biggest threat we face. And let me confess, when I worked for you, we were doing a, a Middle East assessment project. I, did, I wasn't thinking anything about China I remember making fun of Matt Pottinger for being a, a Mandarin linguist and China specialist when I was a smart Arabic guy, you know, and he was right and I was wrong, I guess. Um, but what, what, I guess, why should we care about uh, the Chinese Communist Party? 
Yeah. What's the big deal if they dominate, even right. they're near abroad right. uh, in Asia? Well, I mean, the the the, uh, what, the reason we should care is because if the Chinese Communist Party succeeds in what it's trying to do, the world will be less free, less prosperous, and less safe. And what they're trying to do is to gain a position of preponderant power across the Indo-Pacific region in a way that excludes the United States, in a way that allows them to create servile relationships in kind of a new form of the, you know, of the of the Chinese Empire, the old tributary system, where they set the terms, and then to isolate isolate their regional competitor Japan after they push us out of Asia, and then to challenge the United States globally, not just in a way that threatens our security. And by the way, they've engaged in I think the largest peacetime military buildup in history. They've increased their defense spending 800 percent, 800 percent since the early 90s. Uh, but but also from an economic perspective, they want to dominate the emerging global economy by dominating global infrastructure, by dominating the global supply chains, and by 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 dominating global communications networks as well as as critical geostrategic nodes uh, that are that are essential uh, to trade and, and commerce. And so it's it's really important for us uh, because China is not only not only are they. Uh, not just only the, the, the Chinese Communist Party extending and tightening its exclusive grip on power internally through an unprecedented campaign of of uh, of a of a Orwellian kind of technologically enabled surveillance state and, and a campaign of cultural genocide, you know, in, in Xinjiang, but they're exporting their state as an authoritarian model in a ways in ways that cuts against the interests of the free world, and, and so this is the competition uh, I think of our era, the, the most important one. And we can do this. We can do it because you know what? We've been our own worst enemy for a long time because we essentially vacated arenas of competition under the assumption that, hey, the Chinese Communist Party, if we welcome China into the international order, they'll play by the rules. And as they prosper, they'll liberalize their economy and then they'll liberalize their form of governance. Well, they're doing the opposite. And so we have to re-enter arenas of competition that we vacated. Well, what I think is most, and the book is filled with not only incredible analysis to this problem, but interesting stories uh, from your time uh, as national security advisor that frame this this issue. But what's interesting to me is I actually think the untold story of the last four years is the level of consensus that actually exists around the national security strategy you wrote, which posits that China is our pacing threat. Right. So I'm curious where you think, that, assuming that we're not going to go back to the status quo ante of trying to you know, moderate their political behavior by further integration of the global economy, assuming there's some form of economic decoupling that's going to happen, where do you think the fault lines are? Where are the different camps right yeah. now? And right. There might be a camp that thinks climate change is so important. We have to work with the Chinese or where do you where do you right. see those new fault lines? Well, I, as, as you mentioned, I think there is a great deal of bipartisan support on this. Thanks to you uh, as well, because you've built a lot of that in the House. I take full credit. It was all me, really. <laughs> I saved the republic. And thank you for noticing. <laughs> Hey, but what you've written on this has been, has been really good too, Mike. And so, so I, I think it's important to communicate to the American people what the threat is. You know, because this is not your normal, you know, old Cold War competition, right? This isn't your grandfather's or your grandmother's Cold War. It's a much greater challenge because of how how intertwined we are, and how this competition is taking place, not just between governments and militaries and diplomats and spies, right? This goes into our our private sector. We have, in many ways, been financing our own demise here, <laughs> and, and we have to come to grips with this. You know, across corporate America, across our financial sector on Wall Street, have to recognize that we should not be complicit in allowing our strategic rival to gain differential advantages over over us. Certainly in defense, with dual use technologies, in particular, uh, but but also in, in the emerging data global economy, data driven global economy. So it's it's a much different it's a much different competition than in the past. What I worry about to get to your question is is that I think that there's a tendency in politics these days because it's so partisan, right? It's so polarized that any administration comes in has this impulse. Hey, well, whatever my predecessor do, I need to do the opposite. I I hope that that's that wouldn't be the case on China because there ought to be consensus here. I hear language though about oh we need to cooperate more with China on issues of climate change and and human rights. Mike, I, I would say I think that's laughable. Of course, we would love to. We keep that door open, but the big problem in climate change, change, it's China largely. I mean, they're building 50 to 70 coal-fired plants a year. You know, and and 
And uh, they have no regard for environment or, or climate that, that I can discern. They talk a great game. Xi Jinping gave a great speech, you know, at the UN General Assembly. He said climate a lot. He said environment a lot. He talked about cooperation. Okay, but he's not doing any of that, uh, except trying to corner the market on renewables so they can undercut U.S. jobs and U.S. industry. When you know, We used to have 32 companies that, that built solar panels. I mean, now we have two. And the reason for that is they store technology. We tra willingly transferred it with some companies who, you know, who, who were in it for short-term profits. And then they subsidize production at artificially low, uh, low cost, and then dump dump that all on, you know on the global market and drive us out of business. So, so I, they talk a good game, but they don't follow up. And human rights, it's laughable, right? I mean, look at Xinjiang, look at Hong Kong. I mean, in Xinjiang, there is a I, I call it a cultural genocide because Uyghur birth rates are down 60%. There are over a million people in concentration camps. Just last week, Xi Jinping said, oh, yeah, yeah we're, 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 we're building additions on these concentration camps because it really benefits the population, this re-education that we're doing. It's scary, Mike, you know, and, and I think that, uh, that we have to be cognizant of the fact that we cannot aid and abet it. You know, in, in, the, in the book, I, I talk about U.S. investment in artificial intelligence. U.S. private equity and venture capital firms invested more in 20, I think, 18 or 19, one of those years, in Chinese artificial intelligence companies than they did in U.S. artificial intelligence companies. We ought to be embarrassed by that, right? I think stakeholders of companies ought to say, hey, stop it. Stop enabling this authoritarian regime. Stop enabling, enabling our strategic rival and invest uh, more in America. How much resistance did you, and I don't mean that as a loaded term, resistance, capital R, did you encounter, and I don't mean this as like a commentary on some sort of deep state, uh, among just kind of the rank and file interagency types, uh, either in the military or foggy bottom with this, I mean, because this is a remarkable reorientation of U.S. foreign policy. I would posit the biggest such reorientation since the end of the old Cold War. And it's yeah. hard to get the massive national security bureaucracy to buy into something that big. Did you, was there some yeah. skeptics that you had to confront? You know, I'll tell you, I, I think in many ways we're, we, we had to convince some people, but we were pushing kind of on an open door across the government. And the reason is, I, I think it's a fair criticism of the Obama administration to say they clung too long to this false hope that China was going to suddenly see the light and, and liberalize and play by the rules. And as a result, there were long term civil servants in all the departments and agencies who were ready, who were ready to 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 compete more effectively with China. Let's just take Department of Justice as an example. Uh, the, the formation of, of the China team there under John Demers, I mean, they've done a really great job, but they couldn't wait. They couldn't wait to open investigations on Chinese industrial espionage, Chinese theft of our, of our most sensitive technologies and intellectual property. And they've done a really great job, as, as you've seen, you know, with just, I mean, in orders of magnitude, larger investigations uh, and indictments and prosecutions. And so that was the case pretty much across departments and agencies. You know, we'd stopped really focusing as much as we should uh, in connection with intelligence, you know, collection, and understanding of these threats. Uh, we, we had not competed uh, from, you know, from a commerce perspective with the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, uh, for example, or IEPA, which is looking at, you know, the degree to which, you know, we're, our investments overseas could make us vulnerable and commercial relationships could make, could make us vulnerable. Uh, and, and so, that's all changed and we have to get better at it. We're still behind, I think, but now we're mainly behind in the private sector, I would say. And this is where corporations, I think, have to do a better job um, based on, on, I think, this growing recognition that this is a competition that involves them too, right? And, and, um, and so I, I think there's a lot of work to be done, but I think the shift has occurred. I don't think we're gonna turn the clock back to 2016, but I do worry, I do worry about if it, if it is a Biden administration, I hope they don't come in saying, oh, we just need to cooperate. And that opens the door for the Chinese, right? Because they would love to say, oh, we want to cooperate too. And so let's restart our strategic dialogues. All the false promises, you know, that result in like zero progress, except, except to avoid the, the, the measures we would take to compete effectively. We, ha we, have, to, we, we have to make sure we don't, we don't do that. Well, there's definitely a faction in that camp that I think has convinced themselves that tensions in the relationship are just a product of Trump uh, and not a function of the behavior of the Chinese <laughs> Communist Party. Uh, and I yeah. think it would be wrong if they told themselves that continuing fiction.
going forward. Well, yeah, it is. It is a complete fiction, right? It's a demonstrable fiction, right? So, so if this is a U.S.-China problem, and if this is a problem because you know, I mean, Donald Trump is just so mean that Xi Jinping had to act out in these ways, right? I mean, come on. So look at okay, they foisted COVID nineteen on the world. They they lied about it. They suppressed the doctors who were trying to blow the whistle on it. You know, they, they stopped domestic travel before they stopped international travel. They undermined the World Health Organization so they couldn't blow the whistle. Then they add insult to injury with, you know, with wolf warrior diplomacy, you know, which you've described extremely well. Then, then what they did is they launched cyber attacks in the middle of a pandemic against all of our medical research facilities and pharmaceutical companies. And then, and then they, they, they passed a national security law and they suppressed freedom in Hong Kong. And then they, they attacked along the Himalayan border against India and bludgeoned Indian uh, uh, soldiers to death. Then they rammed vessels and sank them in the South China Sea in their attempt at the greatest land grab, so to speak, in history. Then they threatened Taiwan. Then they threatened Japan and the Senkakus. Okay, tell me again. Tell me again how this is a this is a U.S. China problem. This is a free world China problem, right? And and this is a problem of the Chinese Communist Party's making. And and we have to wake up to that, or else we're just going to be chumps, you know, and uh, and we're going to be apologists for our enemy and let them get away with this aggressive behavior. Well, it's just also one of the reasons why you know your book is so good because you're you disappoint everybody. I think uh, if people that buy it looking for a juicy tell all, all just criticizing the president are going to be profoundly disappointed. But simultaneously, you're not hesitant on on where you disagree with uh, the administration, certainly on on Afghanistan uh, policy. But just one area where I think there's there's been maybe a disconnect between the official narrative that the media has run with and the actual reality on the ground is when it comes to Russia. Uh, and, and it strikes me that for all the rhetoric about, oh, Russian collusion and we're caving to Putin, uh, we've actually been pretty darn tough on the Russians over the last few years. Can you talk a little bit about that approach? Uh, absolutely. So so what, what we what we determined is, you know, the competition with Russia is different from the competition with China. And it's different because, you know, Vladimir Putin doesn't have the same resources, right? It's a much different situation for him. He has he has limited economic power. It is, his, his economy is about the size of Texas's economy or, or Italy's economy. You know, he, he, this was supposed to be a big year for him. It's not a big year. COVID hit them hard like it's hit everybody hard. But they were they were actually much less prepared than we were. Uh, for He's COVID. like the Eagles, like a, 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 the top power in a crappy division. Let's say. <laughs> hey, they just started their comeback, though. And I think, you know, I think if you look at the long term prospects for the Eagles are very good. <laughs> But the long-term prospects for Russia not that good because of yeah. demographics and other and other factors. So, but but you know what he's going to do? You know what Putin's going to do because he can't compete on his own terms, right? He's going to drag everybody else down, right? And, and what, what he's going to do that through a sustained campaign of of what described in the book as disinformation, uh, disruption, and denial, right? And 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 this disinformation comes in the form mainly of cyber-enabled information warfare against us, and the purpose of it. The purpose isn't to determine the outcome of elections. The purpose is to divide us as a people, to pit us against each other on issues of race and gun control and immigration, whatever is polarizing, and to magnify extreme voices on both sides of, of any issue, and to reduce our confidence in our democratic principles and institutions and processes. And you know, I'll tell you what, Mike, I, I don't think the Russians cared who won in 2016. In fact, they thought, I think like most Americans, Hillary Clinton was going to win. What they wanted to do was sow doubts about the outcome. In fact, they had a whole campaign ready in 2016 to say, hey, Trump would have won if the, if the, if the election wasn't rigged. And they quickly had to change it you know, because Trump won to, to a campaign of, well, he would have won the popular vote. And you see them doing that now. And, and you know, we, I think you know, in, in the first, you know, at least at the time that I was there, we took a lot of strong actions against the Russians. I mean, much, I, mean I think we shocked them you know, with the amount of sanctions we opposed. More sanctions in the first year of the Trump administration than the previous eight years of the of the Obama administration. And then also we took some very important defensive measures. The changes in cyber policy, immensely important, recognizing that a good defense requires a good offense, you know, for example. And then and then putting it in, into the, the cyber uh, infrastructure uh, protection organizations and, and the, the headquartered at uh, at Homeland Security. I'm messing up the name of that, but but really focusing on on protecting all of our cyber infrastructure, but also with an emphasis on election infrastructure. So we saw a huge difference between 2016 and 2018. 
the Russians and the Internet Research Agency, you know, which is an extension of their intelligence, they were they were frustrated, I think, you know, but and, and now I think we're in pretty good shape. You know, we're in good shape for for 20, you know, for 2020 election. Um, I, I don't think there's enough publicity about what our government's done, you know, to protect uh, to protect the, the, the election. I wish the president wouldn't, wouldn't sow doubts about it. I don't know why, why he's saying this. I mean, I, it creates opportunities for the for the for the Kremlin, you know, and. And so I, I think that we can be our own worst enemies. And the story that I tell in Battlegrounds, Mike, is how during 2016, both parties, both parties compromised principle for expediency and pursuit of partisan po- political advantage. And, and, and the Russians played them. And, and we can't fall into that trap anymore. You know, Fiona Hill, who was a great civil servant, great, uh, worked with her on, on the NSC staff. She wrote a great op-ed in the New York Times uh, a few days ago, where she said, "Okay, I wish the president wouldn't say, you know, uh, you know, it, it, you know, it was it wasn't the, 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 the Russians, or I'm not sure about whether they attacked our election. Of course they did, but she also wishes people on, on the other side of the political spectrum wouldn't say, well, the Russians clearly threw the 2016 election, which they didn't, right? So, so it, it just we're our own worst enemies. We have to stop doing it. We have to come together as Americans, and uh, and that's the only way I think we're going to be able to defeat this campaign." Well, in light of that, do you have an opinion on this sort of increasing trend of retired military officers involving themselves in politics? Uh, I do think this presents a little bit of a problem for civil relations. I know that's sort of a random topic, but I'd be curious if you have yeah. some thoughts on that. Well, I, th- I think, you know, as usual, I think you're, you're right on this. This is an important issue that we're not talking enough about. Hey, I, I, res- I respect you. Know, <laughs> I respect uh, the the the, uh, the rights and and the freedom of my fellow washed up uh, generals and admirals <laughs> to make whatever statements they want or you know sign whatever list they want. But I, what I'm tr- what I'm trying to do with this book and with with discussions that follow with my second career is I think everybody faces a fundamental choice, right? Do you get drugged down into partisan politics or do you transcend it, right? I'm gonna try. I would like to try to transcend it. And, and I think it's particularly important for certainly the military, where there should be a bold line between the military and partisan politics. You know, Mike, I never voted in, in my career. Uh, career. I, I went to West Point when I was 17. And I, I think everybody should vote, by the way. And, and I don't expect even other servicemen and women to, to not vote. I think you should vote to do what you should you, you think you should do. But I wanted to be studiously apolitical like George Marshall had been. And I think even in retirement, you know, I don't want to get drugged down into partisan politics. I think what is what, what concerns me these days is that is that the, the you know the, there's this effort to try to cloak a partisan agenda or a particular candidate or or a, or a campaign in the legitimacy of the military. We don't want to drag the military into partisan politics. And when we have these dueling lists of generals and admirals, hey, I got I have more generals and admirals than you do. You know, it's just I think first of all I think it's silly. Second of all. I think you know there's there's a, there's a danger to it, right? And we have to remember our founders were really worried about this, you know. And and you mentioned Washington's Crossing. It's a, it's a it's a great book because it, it really reveals a lot of these tensions early uh, in our struggle for independence. But George Washington's grandparents fled the English Civil War, and they had in mind the specter, the danger of of Cromwell, you know, the man on horseback who would extinguish liberty. And the radical idea of our revolution is that hey, sovereignty lies. You know, not with king or parliament. You know, definitely not with you know a military dictatorship. It lies with the people. We have to fight to preserve that, and and one of the ways that we preserve it is with that bold line between the military. And you know what? For young men and women out there, I don't care if you're Democrat, Republican. I don't care what your skin color is. I don't care what your sexual orientation is. I just say, if you want to serve, it is tremendously rewarding to serve. If you meet the standards of our military to serve, if you want to challenge, if you want to be part of an organization where the man or woman next to you is willing to give everything, including their own lives for you, right? This is this is what you ought, you ought to pursue and, and to be part of something bigger than yourself and be part of a team where, where you're bound together by a covenant, a covenant of self-sacrifice and honor, you know, and, and a covenant between you and your society that doesn't include partisan politics. That means you're going to serve you know, whoever the American people elect as as the as, as the commander in chief, but and you're going to swear your allegiance, which is unique in our democracy, to our constitution, right? And and we have to preserve all that. We can't take it for granted. 
Hell yes, is what I have to say to that. Uh, okay, we have a few minutes left. Uh, we only paid lip service to your book, which is phenomenal. I'm not allowed to promote it technically, but it's great, and I read it and all that. So I don't ethics people make sure I'm not. Don't send me to jail. Um, uh, okay, so you mentioned Marshall. Uh, who was he? One of your heroes throughout your career? Who were kind of the the yeah. figures, either historical or actual mentors right. you had that you really looked to and yeah. tried to shape your career after? You know, from a historical perspective, you know, I, I would say that, I mean, it's tough to beat George Washington, right? I mean, the guy, the guy wasn't dealt a great hand, you know, and, 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 and he did a phenomenal job of leadership. You mentioned uh, the book, Washington's Crossing, you know, so the, the battles of Trenton and Princeton, that was bold. That was bold. And I think I really like military leaders in particular, admire them, who see opportunities where others see only difficulties. And and I, I think they're you know that you mentioned MacArthur. I mean he was brilliant, he was flawed, you know, he had a lot of work, you know, in his personality. But but you know, he was a little bit of an egomaniac, you know, to put it mildly. But in the inshot, you know, I mean that was that was a brilliant stroke of genius. I mean you're, you're beleaguered, you're you're fighting a defensive fight in the Pusan perimeter, and he says, Hey, I think I, what we should do is we should attack. You know, uh, with an amphibious assault behind him. I mean, and, and, and so, so I, 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 you know, I admire commanders who look for those opportunities. Uh, I, I think other generals uh, who I admire in terms of their command uh, in wartime is, is U.S. Grant. You know, I, I mean, the, the guy was a phenomenal leader and so unlikely a leader, Mike. We were talking about how career paths can take odd turns. I mean, he was the least likely. So uh, the selling least likely firewood command. after the. Uh, you know, his first stint in the military back home, poor. Exactly. It was his, his father-in-law's tannery, you know, and, yeah. and, uh, and, 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 uh, and his, his, his leadership, I think, was, was, was brilliant. If you read his instruction to the armies when he took over, it is a model of, of clarity in terms of, of his concept. Uh, his memoirs, I, I highly recommend. Um, and, then, and, then, and then I think in, in, World War, in World War II, uh, Gen General Ernest Harmon, who was not, not very well known, he was a division commander. He was just a he was just a great commander. I also admire those who can revise their conception of how to fight and how to lead, uh, but remain true to kind of the fundamentals. Were you a so good pastor guy at all? You know, I was a good was, pastor, and a good pastor was phenomenal. He was a yeah. great soldier, statesman, model, right? Uh, uh, and and you know, he was the superintendent of West Point when I arrived there in 1980. And he had taken he had taken a demotion, right? He'd been a four star. Took took a demotion to be the superintendent of West Point in that difficult time. They had just come out of a cheating scandal there, and then they were integrating women, and that had not gone super well at the beginning. So they needed somebody with his you know his gravitas, his his wisdom. Yeah. And, that and, alone uh, is such a powerful leadership lesson. I, mean, I don't know a lot of people that at that level. I mean, once you're a four star, you're basically a demigod that would be willing to take a promotion. That's amazing. <laughs> Right, um, right. What about so, uh, uh, writers? Are there writers you keep coming back to? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, for that... sure. Yeah. So I would say, you know, in, in fiction, I mean, Tolstoy is just so brilliant. I mean, he's the best. He describes the human experience and relations, but then he also places them in context of, 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 of the times and geopolitical struggles. His short stories that, 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 that look at the emotional and psychological experience of combat, Sebastopol sketches. Uh, I think it's called the wood felling or the tree felling. I mean, these are these are, br are, are brilliant, I think, uh, essays uh, that illuminate uh, the human dimension and psychological dimension of, of combat. I think from, uh, you know, from a, a policy and, and an analytical perspective, George Kennan, it, you know, it's, it's tough to, to beat him from a historian perspective. Another, another Wisconsinite right another there. Another Wisconsinite there, you know. Uh, Got me think of, of other Wisconsinites. I mean, I, I think, but but I I really I mean I I try to just read widely. I admire a lot of of of, uh, of historians. Um, but you read fiction. You make time to read fiction. Yeah, I, I you know I should make more. I haven't lately because I was you know this book you know uh, this book was a uh, it was the product battlegrounds. Thank you, battlegrounds. <laughs> Available. It, it was in many ways a continuation of my self education. Mike, so I have a recommended reading section in the back of the book because I hope that the book will, you know, I, you know, I don't pretend that this is going to be the definitive take on any of these challenges. I want people to, I hope if they if they read it, to have discussions about it, to challenge, you know, my my recommendations. Uh, and I've included some some great some great books uh, in, in in the recommendation section. 
uh, for example, we've talked quite a bit about China. John Pomfret's book on the on the U.S. Uh, the American China relationship from the 18th century to today, called uh, "The Beautiful Country in the Middle Kingdom." I mean, it's 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 big. You know, it, it takes a while to get through it, but it's worth the time. It's it's an extraordinary work of, of history uh, and ver and very readable as as well. I'm reading a book right now on uh, on the Kremlin and the people around Putin called Putin's People. That's very good. I'm reading a book on the on the uh, on the long uh, competition between Saudi Arabia and Iran. It's in the recommended reading, uh, also of of uh, Battlegrounds by Kim Goddess uh, called uh, called the the Black Wave, um, and I'm reading a book by by uh, Thomas Ridd on on disinformation, Russian disinformation and, and, and propaganda in historical perspective. But I you know I, I'm reading a book on on how segregation happened uh, called called the, uh, uh, the the line of uh, of color the color line. Um, uh, by, by I think Robert Rubenstein. God, I don't know if I get that right. I can't remember. But essentially, what he what he does is he makes the argument that it was policies and laws that 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 set up segregation and inequality of opportunity. And it's kind of a depressing story. You know, it largely focuses on the post World War II period uh, and the period during the Great Migration. The color, the line of color, I think it's called. But but I I, uh, I think the good news story is, hey, if if policies created the problem, you know, maybe policies can. You know, can then address address uh, the problems set associated with inequality of opportunity. So I always I always have like five or six books going, you know, and and I'm in a great environment, you know, in, in, you know at who at the Hoover Institution. I work with great students, you know. Anybody Mike who says, "Hey, this young generation, they just don't get it. They don't care. They don't." I think that's complete nonsense. I think there is a tremendous desire to serve among our young people. Um, and and they, they, whenever I interact with them, they restore my faith, you know, in our in our country and our prospects. So second to last question, when you're not reading five books simultaneously, do you have any more lowbrow guilty pleasures in the Netflix, uh, Amazon Prime variety, something yeah, like that? Uh, of course, of course. OK. All right. So, I mean, Yellowstone, man, it's good. It's really Everyone good. keeps recommending this to me. It's good. It's good. I mean, it's, it's really great acting, good storyline. Uh, re really complex issues at work there, you know, between Native American rights and and their, their, their displacement, the legacy of that big development versus the American rural ideal. Yeah, there's organized crime. I mean, it's it's it, it, cor corrupt local governance. And so, I mean, it's it's really good. It's really good. But, you know, I'll tell you, I, I hate to, maybe, maybe I mean, don't think less of me, but, I, you know, I like the old Columbos, man. I've been binge watching those on Peacock. And you know what I love about it? They're period pieces, man. It's like the early 70s, you know. First of all, the guy's a great character because everybody underestimates the guy. I know? think you deliberately adopt a Columbo affect sometimes <laughs> to fool your enemies into <laughs> underestimating you. I think there's a connection here, and you won't admit and it. it. You know, and it's, it's you, know, and, and, you know, I live in California now. You know, it's L.A. in the 70s. You know, you've got, like, people with the leisure suits, the bell bottoms. I mean, it's just... He's really, he's really the producer. Must have been really into cars. There's always cool automobile. And anyway, it's, it's, and they have the best actors of that era come in for the episodes, you know. And it's, and it's reverse, right? It's not like it's not who done it. Like you don't know who does it. You see the murder up front, and then you watch him uncover it. You know, it's kind of a cool, it's a cool uh, 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 way of, of putting it together. Um, and then, and then you know, yeah, I, I like watching documentaries and that kind of thing as well. Uh, you know, I like listening to books on, on tape when I'm working out too. Uh, the, the other thing I do a lot of is, is uh, you know, try to stay in shape because a body like this doesn't just happen, Mike, you know, um, and, uh, and uh, as you get older, it's more and more of a struggle. And when gyms are closed, it's a struggle. But it, but here, you know, we're, we're on vacation. Here. I'm doing a lot of stand up paddle boarding, which I think nice. is great. it's a great. It's a great workout and good time to think and everything, too. OK, but, you know, you know the, the best pastime I have is that this pandemic, we are very lucky that obviously we can work from home, but also that my son-in-law can work from home. So my daughter and him and our one-year-old twin grandsons have been with awesome. us. And that's been such a joy, as you know, with the, with the, with the, an infant and now a young child, uh, baby, uh, watching them grow and develop in that first year as grandparents, what a great gift that's been to that's us. Amazing. And the, they're, they're a hoot. I mean, they're, they're, they're fun to be around. They're a lot of work for, you know, for, for, you know, for members of our family, my daughter in particular, but man, I, I mean, I, you know, th that's been a real joy for us. Is this a son-in-law who was an army officer? Yeah. Yeah. So he served in the Ranger Regiment uh, at, at, on active duty. 
And now it's, it's remained in the reserves as well. I'm just saying it takes a lot of cojones to marry the daughter of a general. So I respect <laughs> and admire this man immensely. Hey, you know, a good, a good, a good friend of mine uh, and yours, Chris Gibson, former congressman and, and also retired ar- army officer. Uh, you know, he, he had uh, one of my daughter's old, old boyfriends interviewed for a job with him, you know, and, and, uh, and I put in a good word for him. You know, he goes, Hey, you're, you know, you're, you're dating uh, HR master's daughter. He goes, man, you're either really stupid or you're one brave son of a son of a gun. And so you have the job if you want it. <laughs> <laughs> I but love hey, that. But people don't realize how huggy I am, Mike. You know, I'm I know. Just, I, mean, I, you know, it's if this is your next book, something about, you know, I may have stars on my shoulders, but, you know, I want to hug. Uh, well, okay. Post-COVID, so post COVID hugs. Yeah, post COVID, post COVID. Okay, so last question, HR. And before we do, so people can find one, they can find Battlegrounds wherever books are sold. Uh, you are at Hoover. Uh, you are on a podcast with Neil Ferguson uh, called Goodfellows, correct? Yeah, John Cochran called Goodfellows. And okay. hey, here's here's what I'd love to plug because I believe in the in the mission with it. We there, we have now have a video series called Battlegrounds. And oh, it's cool. long format interviews with world leaders. And it's and it's it's an effort to develop what I call for in the book, which is strategic empathy, the ability to understand complex challenges from the perspective of others. So the interviews are with Mohammed Hanif Atmar, uh, the, the, the now the foreign minister of Afghanistan, my former now security advisor counterpart with Mariangela Zappia, who, who was my national security advisor counterpart from Italy uh, and is now the Italian permanent rep at the UN. So that's that's a show kind of on Europe and Italy and the Mediterranean. Then uh, we have an episode uh, that completed with uh, uh, Ho Young An, who was the, the South Korean ambassador to the U.S. when I first became national security advisor. Great guy. The next interview, which I'm uh, filming soon, is with uh, Minister uh, Taro Kono, uh, from, who, who, who was just recently the Minister of Defense and, uh, and, and, uh, and Minister of Foreign Affairs in Japan. So, so, so Battlegrounds, Battlegrounds is a series designed to develop strategic empathy. And then, and then I have this great, uh, you know, this great uh, gift of being able to work uh, with the Hudson Institute as the Japan chair, and with the Foundation for Defense of Democracy on, at the center of military and political power. So all these kind of fit together. Like in my, in my second career, you know, I made a mission statement for myself, Mike, which is to to try to help foster discussions about the greatest challenges that we face uh, as a way to develop better policies and as a way to bring Americans together. So. Any venue that I can use to, to help do that, and I try to make time for it. That's amazing. Um, okay, so final question. When you come to Green Bay to visit me, um, and I hope you bring your wife, because I like her much better than you, no offense. Um, <laughs> uh, and we're, you know, the Packers and the Eagles are playing. You beat us last year, by the way, the Thursday before my wedding. It was a bad, it actually ended up being a good omen in a weird way. Um, and then we're, we're having a beer in the shadow of Lambeau Field, and a kid from Northeast Wisconsin comes up to you and says, General McMaster, I'm a huge fan of yours. I've read all your books. Uh, I want to serve in the military, and I want a career where I can serve, but also you know, write and, and think about uh, foreign policy. What advice would you have for that young Wisconsinite? Hey, I, I, w- I would say do it. You know, I, I think it is tremendously rewarding to serve in our military. There are so many opportunities you know, within and across all of our armed forces, learn about them, think about what would challenge you, what you would find fun and, and interesting and, and rewarding and do it, but recognize as well that, hey, you know, that, that, is, that is not going to put you on, on, a, on a determined path. You're going to have a lot of flexibility to, to pursue your interests and to make the kind of contribution you want to make. And, and you know, I, I think that, that we undervalue the less tangible rewards of service oftentimes, Mike, and then the American people, because... Not as many people serve, you know, not as many people can talk about service that that they they don't really recognize the rewards. They see maybe only the difficulties associated with service. Uh, And and I think you emerge from military service, you know, stronger. uh, And and if you even if you just serve for a short time, uh, I think it makes you a better citizen. It makes you more valuable uh, to whatever walk of life you go into. Great advice uh, from a great man, one of only three human beings alive I would I would follow into a hail of gunfire. So H.R. McMaster, thank you for 
uh, taking some time. And thank you for your leadership. Really appreciate it. Well, Mike, thanks for your leadership and, and, and service. And, and what a pleasure it's been to be with you. All right. The dude.